My name is Richard Batten, and I'm the Global Chief Sustainability Officer for JLL. I was asked if I could give you an idea of how a corporate real estate company treats sustainability. And at JLL, we treat it very seriously. So in a quick 20 minute overview, let's try and show you what we're doing about sustainability at JLL. First of all, perhaps I ought to explain that we're a company that is global. We have 93,000 people working for us out of 460 offices, and we operate in 80 countries around the world. So what are our recent highlights? And I've got three really to, uh, to talk to you about. The first one is the announcement of our corporate purpose. Our purpose is to shape the future of real estate for a better world. This is what drives everything that we try to do in JLL. We work on five macro trends. That is what is gonna drive the future of our business. And those five trends are a belief that there will be an increase in capital investment into real estate. So that's from the investor side. We also believe that there will be an increase in corporate outsourcing to service providers such as JLL. We believe, and this is, uh, has a lot to do with, uh, uh, with climate change as well, we believe that there will be an increase in urbanization around the globe as we go forward. And supporting those three macro trends, we believe that there will be, where you guys come in, uh, an increase in technology support to enable those to be achieved, to enable everything that we're doing just us, but everybody, the importance of technology can only increase. And the fifth macro driver that we uh, have adopted is that of sustainability, that sustainability will become more important, not less, as we go forward and will continue and in increasingly drive our strategy going forward. So if that's the first of our highlights, the release of our purpose, let's look at the second main highlight. This is all to do about carbon emission reduction. How do we fight climate change? And in order just to give you an idea as to what our carbon footprint looks like, when we talk about carbon, we split it into three scopes, scope one, scope two, scope three, our scope one, uh, emissions are essentially based around our fleet. Fossil fuel, um, so petrol generally, but our fleet emissions. Scope two is essentially our offices, the offices that we work in and how we heat, how we cool those offices. And scope three, scope three is treated a little differently and those are emissions that we have less total control over, and it's more third party emissions as a result of activities that we engage in. But you can see there at close to 12.5 million metric tons, our client emissions are totally dominant. So what we did, once we'd actually calculated our, our emission base, we calculated what, uh, what we would need to do in order to satisfy probably the primary goal of ensuring that JLL kept its carbon footprint sufficiently low that we did not contribute to global warming more than one and a half degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. To tie our carbon emission reduction into a science-based target. And that's what we have done. So we have now committed to a science-based target across the three scopes, vehicles, buildings, and clients. What does that actually mean? But it means that for scope one and scope two, electric vehicles through operational efficiencies, through renewable energy and the purchase of renewable energy certificates, we will reduce our carbon footprint by 70% by 2034. So that's, our commitment in respect of scope one and two, and then over scope three, those third party emissions, we are only focusing on our client emissions, and I'll explain why in a moment, 
but you can see there that we are helping them working in partnership with our clients to help them reduce their own emissions by 53 percent over that period so let's have a look at what we might be doing in order to achieve it you can see the black line here this is business as usual so this uh, our projections are assuming irrespective of COVID-19 that we will have a uh, we, we are still on a growth curve so this is assuming growth um, even though we're putting in uh, emission reduction uh, uh, processes in place the growth over the first couple of years is outweighing those but the business as usual assumes a decarbonization of the grid and that's what will happen just normally between now and 2034 according to these projections this line here is actually assuming the operational efficiencies we put into our workplace that is focused around things like um, improved sensors improved lighting we generally do it uh, on lease events when we can actually get our landlords to uh, landlords to actually ensure that they will pay for it or we will move buildings in order to move to a greener building uh, the blue and the orange is the impact in the reduction process over the time of our move over to electric vehicles absolutely crucial significant part of our 70 percent reduction is going to come from the move to electric vehicles both in europe and in uh, the us the gray line here is our move over to renewable energy so that's the renewable energy um, shift that we'll be making over that period and we are forecasting at the moment that globally we might not be able to move over to renewables in every country we're operating and where that happens then we'll pick up renewable energy certificates and that's the gap for renewable energy certificates the the impact they will have and you can see here this blue dotted line that is our 70 percent target and that's where we need to get to by uh, 2034. And then I said I'd come back to scope three. You can see in the red here the total dominance of our client emissions. So quite apart from the commuting, the air travel, et cetera, they pale into insignificance compared to our client emissions. And it's by working with our clients where they'll let us do that, that we'll be able to help them reduce their footprint as well. Now, having got to a science-based target route and our pathways um, for tracking that through, we're now in a position to actually start looking at other targets for client uh, for emission reduction. And you will hear a lot of noise coming on now, especially as we move through to COP26, a move to, to net zero. COP26 is the um, big conference coming up deferred this year coming up in Glasgow in 2021 now and that advancement to net zero is where we are now looking and we were very pleased to be able to announce last week our commitment to the World Green Building Council's net zero carbon buildings commitment so and this is where it is here committing to occupying only net zero buildings by 2030 so we will be net zero in our buildings by 2030. And that is the first stage of us moving our, towards a net zero position within the company. But we can only do it by having a very sound uh, building block of science-based targets to work from. So if carbon emissions is the second highlight, the third highlight I wanted to talk about, briefly touch on is the JLL, um, our commitment to TCFD reporting. So this is more a governance issue, financial reporting, where we've now picked up with one of only a limited number of companies, there's only a 100, globe, uh, 100 companies uh, who have committed to the one and a half degree uh, commitment. Um, and under TCFD, we are now reporting the opportunities and risks related to uh, climate when we are uh, submitting our financial disclosures. 
So identifying climate related risk, identifying opportunities that come out of it. And the whole intention of this is to provide greater transparency for the investor community. I said that we were looking to set targets across our sustainability agenda. Our sustainability program is based upon building a better tomorrow. And we have set targets across each of these subheadings that you can see in front of you. Let's take each of those four pillars one by one. First one is, tar uh, is clients. And under clients, you can see the targets are all about training our staff so we can better educate our clients. Talking about emissions reduction, and we've spoken about that um, a fair amount already. We are talking about circularity, how we can create less waste going to landfill, how we can reuse what we already have. Absolutely vital, vitally important in the construction industry, in the, building, uh, the buildings that we operate. How can we make sure that we are not adding to waste? How can we reuse what we have? And then the final piece there is thought leadership, and I'll come on to that later. A good example of some of the client work that we've done would be helping to provide 100% renewable, uh, in this case, wind uh, energy to uh, into it. They were looking for a solution to provide uh, renewable energy in their new headquarters building, and we worked with them to provide that. And you can see huge savings in cost and also huge savings in time. They reached their carbon saving goals four years early as a result of this. The second pillar is people. As you'd expect to see, I suppose, a lot of focus on gender balance and leadership, and that's really important to us, but there's also targets now coming in around equality, and it's equality of, across the spectrum where you'd expect it. As a result of COVID-19, we're also developing um, particularly uh, our mental well-being. Well-being of our staff is really important, but mental well-being has really come to play over the last, uh, over the last six months. And the other area that we're de developing at the moment is satisfaction rates are of inclusion, feeling included within the company. And we're monitoring that and setting our targets accordingly. A uh, good example here is and it doesn't, all these uh, examples of where we're engaging with our people doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be some global program. Here, one of, our, one of our employees in our New York office came across refugee employment program, and we're working with them now um, where legally documented refugees, we are finding workplace opportunities for them. Um, Within, within JLL and uh, with, within a lot of the facilities management work that we're able to do for our clients. So that is a great example, one that anybody can engage, and it isn't just a corporate mentality, individuals can operate equally successfully um, with the same impact. So the third of our pillars is our workplace. And Within the workplace, we are focused on carbon emissions, and we've already gone over that. But you can see here, we're also looking at how we can reduce waste. I was talking about that earlier, but waste, water, how can we reduce that? And in particular, we have a program in place to remove single-use plastics from all of our offices uh, by 2023. And I sincerely hope that we'll be able to do it earlier. Uh, we really need to, there's quite a lot of single use plastics emanating out of COVID-19 that is gonna make this slightly more tricky than we were originally anticipating. But that is certainly something that uh, we are very optimistic of achieving by 2023. The other piece um, up here, we have a large procurement program. We procure on behalf of ourselves and our clients uh, sufficient quantities. Our sustainability procurement framework is designed to impose on our suppliers sustainability conditions to ensure that they comply with uh, the framework for delivery of supplies to us. 
you'll see that here 100% of office space uh, should have a sustainability certification by 2030. And a good example of this would be out in Hong Kong. All of our new offices now have this uh, accreditation. And this particular one is well over 10,000 square feet. And you can see here, LEED Platinum certification. Uh, we have yet to be in well, so LEED is the building itself, the fabric of the building that creates the ability to hold in, um, hold in heat um, or hold in air temperature rather than uh, being influenced by the outside. And the well certification is, what the inside of the building is able to do for the wellness of the of the of, of the people inside that it will will end up with plat well platinum at the end of the day um it's just because of covid we haven't managed to get the inspection process all the way through but that will be a fantastic building well it is a fantastic building because we're already uh, working within it um sub lockdown so uh and let's move on to the fourth of our communities. You can see here that our targets are generally focused around volunteering. 15,000 days is the equivalent of two hours per person per annum. So we're well on track, we were well on track to achieving that by the end of this year. Uh, Covid's created a bit of a hiccup but we're still very confident that we'll get there and other targets around charitable giving and also pro bono work as well. A um, good example of the sort of things we might get engaged in here, and I've chosen another, uh, I've chosen here a small country, Portugal. This is our Lisbon office, who um, set up a partnership with uh, a com an, an NGO in Mozambique. And here you can see that they have, uh, we were trying to uh, further the education for young girls, young women, to stay in education for longer rather than, rather than um, being put back into the villages to work. And that's how it's set out. And that was successful uh, in itself. But whilst we were in the middle of this project, they had a cyclone that hit uh, the, the local community we were working in. And then we then moved the education piece into uh, more of a resilience piece, resilience around uh, the residential accommodation that they're in and trying to help them in their planning as to how you can build more resilient communities to the impact of a cyclone. Right, I said I'd uh, touch on technology. We, um, we, we've already stated that technology is absolutely crucial to JLL. Uh, if we have a problem, the first port of call uh, is technology to find the answer. We also have a prop tech investment company um, called Spark based in Silicon Valley. And we are looking to invest in new uh, property startups. Uh, that's on one part, but from my perspective, we are also looking to invest in green property startups. And there's a number of examples uh, where we are invested, turn tide, disruptive technologies, open space, and perhaps only because I've got a great photograph that goes with this. Um, I'll talk about Turntide, which uh, is the software motor company. And it's essentially putting really clever software alongside a traditional technology of a motor and actually creating efficiencies out of it. Now, this photograph is one of the directors um, fitting one of the software motor systems to uh, an air conditioning unit. That's our low hanging fruit at the moment in these early days. And these air conditioning units sit on top of um, industrial buildings, they sit on top of shopping malls. And this is a picture here of an industrial building in Atlanta. Would you believe this is the roof of it? And I found that surprising when I first saw it. Uh, and he's dragging his sled over the, uh, through the snow uh, on, on the roof of uh, a shed in Atlanta, uh, in, in Alberta, sorry. And these, this software just on its own, the improvements out of technology, we are creating on average 55% savings from, uh, for, for, from what, what we're putting in. And it's not just 
55% savings in energy is 55% savings, therefore, in cost. So it's a financial saving, but it's also 55% saving in carbon emissions. So it, it works all the way around. And there's going to be more and more of these technological solutions to the sustainability issues that are facing us going forward. And I'm going to finish up now on the last piece of what's next. Well, first of all, we have to deliver our targets. And that is something that we are on the way to doing. And we have taken the first steps of these next three year targets to deliver. We have to deliver on those so that we can then develop them going forward. We're obviously on a road to net zero, and I've spoken about that. And I think the net zero piece is gonna be absolutely crucial going forward and probably will be out of all of sustainability programs in its wider definition, I suspect that net zero will be the most important over the next few years. And as we set these targets, yes, they're good targets to have in the first place, but we can say so what to a certain extent. It's all very well reaching the target. So we are now looking at trying to assess the impact Yes, we have a target of 15,000 days volunteering, but what is the impact? What impact are we creating on the communities that we're actually engaging with? And that analysis is happening now across all of our targets. And that is the next stage of our sustainability program going forward. And the final piece is delivery to clients. Because not only is it good business for us if we're able to increase our sustainability services, is good business for our clients. I spoke about our own science-based target uh, agenda. When I went to our board with the, the proposal, if I had just said this is going to cost tens of millions uh, with zero return, I probably would have been shown the door fairly quickly. But sustainability and trying to address carbon emission reduction does not have to cost. For our program, tens of millions of expenditure, but for every dollar we spend, we will be getting back $1.50 in return. And if we calculate that out, we, we'll go positive within five years. And on top of that, throughout the program to 2034, we'll be making a 16% IRR. So a move to sustainability across all of the areas that we've discussed does not necessarily mean it's a cost. What we're doing is increasing productivity and at the same time, we're actually trying to drive those client emission reductions to ensure that we fight climate change. So there will be ultimately a future for all of us and more importantly for our children as well. And on that basis, I'm gonna say thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you, goodbye.